Greetings all. Okay, so this evening's video, I am going back to the last Q&A number 11, in which I had mentioned that I was going to reserve the question of rear versus front drive sprocket for a dedicated video on the subject, because it keeps coming up so often. And I figure I've got this backlog, I might as well start getting rid of it. And this is an easy question, an easy video, I shouldn't spend too much time in editing. I'm not even using the teleprompter. Okay, so before we get going, uh, something that was brought to my attention, I had completely and utterly forgotten that I had actually a significant emotional event t-shirt. And it's also by Everpress, so I've asked them to add it to the shop. If you have already placed an order and you want to bundle it in, I think they will be more than happy if you just email them and say, hey, yeah, look, uh, just add this in and they won't charge you a second shipping unit cost or whatever. You know, it should be fairly simple. If you were watching this video more than about two weeks after I release it, ignore that bit and if you didn't see the last q a this is the latest t-shirt from uh, the forgotten weapons video on how to issue a fire command anyway to the sprocket wheel front versus wheel front versus rear and there are three major reasons and a couple of minor ones in fact when i mentioned it on q a a couple of, this one chap comes up with oh don't what we've noticed in the the caterpillar bulldozer world is uh, uh, there's less stress on the track pins for a rear drive something like that not an important enough criterion really when it comes to the army I can understand it where every little bit of maintenance cost is important to a construction bulldozer but it's not one of the three major reasons why you might choose front versus rear drive on a tank now, we like to think of rear engine, rear drive as a relatively modern concept because, well, that's what they are today. And if you think about most tanks from World War II, that at least the ones that come to mind, like the Sherman or the Tiger, they're rear engine front drive. Uh, but the reality is that it actually isn't all that new a concept. Look at the first tanks. Okay, the, you got a mid-engine tank, sports car for the Mark IV, uh, but the Renault FT, rear engine, rear drive go on let's say to the immediate pre-war period so you're looking at the bts based off the american christie rear engine rear drive or the british cruiser a9 rear engine rear drive but they didn't always come that way so for example it wasn't necessarily a british trait you look at the uh, the vicar six ton the export tank that the british came up with that was a, that was a front engine uh, front sprocket the disadvantages to the front and rear engine versus sprocket are obvious. You have to have a way of getting the power from one end of the tank to the other end of the tank. And that means you have to have a drive shaft. So famously enough, part of the reason that the M4 was so big was because you had that radial engine, I'll put up an inset, and uh, you had to have room under the turret basket, so you needed to have room for the people to sit, sit or stand in the vehicle, and then underneath that have the power shaft, and then underneath the power shaft, basically you got wasted space. That then goes forward and into the front of the vehicle, you have the transmission, of course, and a final drive steering system and all that. It was not necessary to have the angle going forward though for the power shaft. Uh, if you look, they solved part of the problem with the M18. The M18 actually has a transfer case. So instead of being angled downwards with the prop shaft coming down and forwards, the M18 radial engine is purely vertical. And there's a transfer case comes out, comes down and then parallels the bottom of the hull which you would think would save a lot of space, but there was a catch. When they stuck the M36 uh, turret onto the M18, they had to make the turret basket a couple of inches shorter. And you may wonder why, because the M36 and the M18 both have flat power shafts. Well, the difference is the suspension. The M18 has torsion bars, the M36 does not. So it is possible for the M36's power shaft to be right bottom of the hull, whereas the M18, you had to have maybe six inches, okay, maybe a little less for the torsion bar, and then above the torsion bars, then you could have the power shaft. So you didn't get quite as much space saving as you might think. But inches are everything. And it was one of the reasons that uh, a lot of countries were reluctant to go with torsion bars for a while. 
And even today, the lack of a torsion bar on something like a hydrogas suspension system is still considered to be a benefit. So, where are the advantages? Going over the disadvantages. First advantage is you have a lot of room. Remember, we are not talking about today's reliability. You're going to have to get into the system. You're going to have to tinker with it. You might have to make replacements and changes and so on. If you have the engine at one end and the transmission at the other end, you get a lot more room to access it. So you can imagine accessing the transmission for not major repair work. We're not talking about changing out the transmission here, just talking about basic access with a set of tools, open up the casing and see what you can do. You have a lot of room to access a front transmission in a Sherman, in a uh, Panzer IV, in a Panther or whatever. If you got to access a transmission on, let's say, a T34, yeah, it's right at the back. You can take, you can remove the back deck panels and you can access at least one side of it, but you can't get all around it, not nowhere near as easily. So for the common maintenance tasks, which were not infrequent, you did have that advantage. Uh, plus you maybe also had advantages for cooling and so on as well. Your next advantage is going to be related to the linkages. So remember, we are not talking about modern automatic transmissions here, generally speaking. We are talking about a gear shift that you physically move, a lever goes down, there's a linkage that goes over, and maybe if you've got the transmission at the back, there might be another linkage that goes all the way to the back of the uh, engine compartment under the engine, and then there's going to be another linkage to go up into the transmission probably and so on and so forth. It is part of the reason why T34's transmission is so notoriously hard to operate, and you had that sledgehammer thing. It wasn't just T34, KVs were not necessarily the smoothest transmissions in the world either. Now, one exception would be for the pre-war, early war period, the British with the Wilson gearbox, you know, like pre-selector type, for example. and that didn't have quite the same level of linkage because you aren't moving the gears quite in the same way. Uh, and it's, a lot, it, it's not quite an automatic, but you see where I'm going. If you have the driver and the transmission pretty close to each other, the linkages are either not many or there aren't any at all. So there's a number of vehicles that the, you can see, uh, for example, in the recent M38 video I did, the gear shift goes straight into the transmission casing. So it's much easier for the operator, driver, to change gears. It's a, it's a simple little thing, but it so aids fatigue when they don't have to struggle with the gearbox. And obviously also, you're also less likely to, uh, to miss a gear, which means that your tank might slow down due to the friction, and then you gotta start work your way up the gearbox again, or you're less likely to stall the engine at a most inopportune time, which is a bit of a problem when shoot, people are shooting at you, and things like that. Third reason why you would have a, a front drive rear engine is typified by the M18. Now, if you look at the predecessor vehicles to the M18, the T49 gun motor carriage and the T67 gun motor carriage, you'll see that those are rear drive, rear sprocket vehicles, and they have an automatic transmission. Why is it then that when they made the M18, they went to rear, uh, rear engine forward drive? And the reason is balance. When they were designing the vehicle, they realized that in order to get the vehicle to balance correctly, especially because it's such a light vehicle and there isn't much frontal armor to counterbalance what's going on at the back, they had to move the transmission to the front. Otherwise the vehicle would have been unbalanced. Sitting on the back this will lead to track, rate, track uh, retention issues, it may lead to handling issues, and it will certainly lead to flotation issues. So those are your three main reasons why you would have a rear engine and a front drive. So that's the history. How about today? Why would you choose a front or a rear sprocket in today's vehicles? Well, the answer is basically it comes down to where's the engine. Power packs today are so much more reliable. You don't need to have the access to get to them. And because we've now developed the art of quick disconnects to a good enough level that we can do it, you can pull out a power pack, the engine and the transmission both, on a modern tank in maybe as little as 10 minutes. So there isn't really anything to be saved by pulling out separately 
the engine or the transmission. And indeed, it's probably a lot easier to disconnect things like control cables and fuel pipes than it is to disconnect the big heavy pieces of metal that are transmitting the power from the engine to the transmission. So just pull the whole pack out and you can work it that way. And it's nice and compact and because it's now on a hard stand, you can access all the various parts of the transmission or the engine, you know, whatever part of it you need to access. Beyond that, engine location is pretty much defined by necessity. If you are in an APC, you probably want to have the engine at the front so that there is room for a ramp at the back that you can drop down. You can, in theory, have an APC with the engine at the back, maybe off to one side, but it just makes the, the exit passage very narrow. Uh, the, it's not ergonomically friendly for a troop carrier that you want to dismantle a lot of troops and even just regular maintenance of the inside. You're going through this narrow little passageway, you're as well off just getting a big ramp. Besides, you can sleep on the ramp far more easily. On the other hand, if you have a tank, well, you can keep the engine at the back. It also keeps the exhaust signature a little bit lower and it balances the thick, heavy amounts of armor that you have at the front of the tank with the engine at the back. The one exception is Merkaba, which of course has the engine at the front, but that was defined by needing to have an access port at the back for ammunition resupply and then pulling wounded troops out so that you don't have to get them at the top or through this ridiculously small hatch in the base. The balance issue with that, well, you look at just how far back the turret is on Merkava. Now, the Israelis obviously don't seem to have too much of a problem with this. Whether the Americans would accept any of the design limitations that follow, I don't know. But it is notable that basically no other country has done this. I'm not saying the Israelis are wrong. It, obviously, it suits their purposes but it doesn't seem to suit anybody else's purposes. So that's it, engine at the back if you're running a tank today, engine at the front if you're running anything else which requires something other than an engine at the back, i.e. a big hatch. And any of the other arguments about is it easier to pull a track over or pull a track under from underneath? There may be some mechanical differences, but they in no way outweigh the effects of all the other questions of linkages, access, or just do you need to have the engine at the front or the back to make room for what you need to do. Right, that was it. Probably one of my shorter videos. I didn't even sit down, as I say. So I hope you found it interesting and informative, and I will see you on the next Inside the Hatch on Saturday. Take care.